Welcome to the National Crime Victim Law Institute's online toolkit video on the avenues of financial recovery for crime victims. This video provides an overview of how the administrative, criminal, and civil justice systems can help crime victims obtain the financial compensation that they need to survive and heal. Each system has its own rules and procedures, as well as benefits and downsides. The focus of this video is on financial recovery through the legal systems by way of state administrative compensation, criminal restitution, and civil damages. Financial recovery through other means, such as private insurance, is outside the scope of this overview. We'll begin with the administrative avenue, whereby a crime victim may seek assistance from a state victim compensation program. We start with this avenue because victim compensation is usually available sooner than criminal restitution or civil damages, as eligible victims do not have to wait for the completion of a potentially lengthy criminal or civil justice process. Let's address some terminology before we move on. First. All references to states include the District of Columbia. Second, while we refer to victim compensation, keep in mind that some states use other terms such as victim reparations. Third, we're using victim compensation as a term of art to refer only to the compensation paid by state administrative compensation programs. Who pays whom in this system? If a victim's application is granted, the program will pay the victim or, in some cases, pay a service provider on the victim's behalf. The programs pay out of a fund that generally consists of monies collected from court fines and assessments paid by convicted criminal offenders. The eligibility requirements vary from program to program, but some key similarities exist. First, eligibility is not limited to the direct victims of crime. Other persons who suffered harm, including the direct victims' relatives and dependents as well as witnesses and other individuals, may also be eligible. Second. Eligibility is generally limited to persons who suffered harm as a result of a crime against a person, such as offenses like assault and battery, rape, domestic violence, and homicide. While criminal laws may not consider drunk driving a crime against a person, drunk driving is generally considered an eligible crime. Property crimes, such as the theft of a car or vandalism, on the other hand, are not considered eligible crimes. Third, the programs usually require the victim to promptly report the crime to the police. Almost all programs require reporting within a period of time ranging from a number of hours to years. Reporting within 72 hours of the crime or discovery of the injury is a typical deadline. Exceptions may exist for certain victims, such as victims of domestic violence and trafficking, and child victims of sexual assault. Even when a program does not have a specific exception for a particular class of victims, look for a general good cause exception, where late reporting would not hurt eligibility if the victim can demonstrate good cause for the delay. Fourth, all programs require the victims to cooperate with law enforcement and prosecution during the investigation and prosecution of the offender. If a victim did not cooperate on a particular occasion, he or she may still be able to satisfy this requirement by showing that cooperation was not reasonable under the circumstances or that the authorities did not make a reasonable request. Next, the programs usually require that the victims must not have committed any wrongdoing, such as participating or contributing to the crime. Many programs also exclude victims who have been convicted of unrelated crimes within a particular period. Some laws, however, may provide the program administrators with discretion to waive certain elements of these no wrongdoing requirements in some cases. Lastly, the programs usually have a residency requirement. Typically, this means a particular state program may assist only the victims of a crime that occurred in that state, or any resident of that state if the crime occurred in another state or country that does not provide victim compensation to non-residents. Victim compensation programs reimburse eligible claimants for certain out-of-pocket expenses related to the crime. The coverage varies from program to program, but key similarities exist. First. Property losses are usually excluded. Some programs will, however, reimburse the cost to repair or replace certain essential personal property, such as eyeglasses, hearing aids, and wheelchairs. Second, non-economic losses such as pain and suffering are not covered. Third, eligible losses always include expenses for medical care, mental health treatment, lost wages or support, and funerals. Many programs also assist with other crime-related expenses, such as child care, crime scene cleanup, travel and transportation, temporary shelter, and more. Some programs also cover attorney's fees associated with filing a victim compensation claim or proceeding in the appeals process. New Jersey is unique in that its compensation program also covers attorney's fees for a victim's rights attorney who represents the victim in the criminal case. 
and Ohio covers attorney's fees incurred to successfully obtain a restraining order, custody order, or other order to physically separate a victim from an offender. Next, the programs usually have a dollar cap for each category of recoverable losses, as well as a maximum compensation amount that ranges from $10,000 to $70,000. Lastly, the programs are payers of last resort meaning they compensate claimants for losses not covered by another source such as insurance, other government programs, and the offender. Each program has its own application forms and procedures. The forms are usually available online at the Victim Compensation Program website. You can find the website link to each program on NCVLI's online Victim Resources map. The form may also be available from the local police, prosecutor, and victim services offices. These compensation programs generally operate by a reimbursement model, meaning the victim must first incur the out-of-pocket expenses and then submit receipts, cancel checks, or invoices to obtain payment. However, some state programs provide emergency funds in advance for victims who, who face immediate financial hardship and are in need of services. Almost all programs have application filing deadlines, typically within a certain period ranging from six months to three years from the date of the crime but exceptions exist for certain crime victims or for good cause, so be sure to check. No program requires the actual arrest or prosecution of the offender before payment, so crime victims should apply for benefits as soon as possible. If an application is denied in whole or in part, the applicant can appeal the decision. Our next stop is the Criminal Justice Avenue for financial recovery. Who pays whom in this system? Restitution is paid by an offender to the victim after the offender has been convicted in a criminal case. Restitution may be ordered as part of sentencing and or as a condition of parole or probation. In most jurisdictions, crime victims have a constitutional or statutory right to restitution. Whether a person is a crime victim for purposes of the right to restitution and all other victims' rights depends on the legal definition of victim set forth in a jurisdiction's constitution, statutes, or rules. For example, in some states, a crime victim is any person who suffers any physical, financial, or psychological harm as a result of a crime. In other states, a person may be considered a victim for purposes of restitution and other rights only if he or she were the victim of a particular type of crime. Non-victims who have incurred a loss, such as victim compensation programs, victim services providers, and others, may also be eligible. Problems may arise as a result of plea bargains. For example, in some cases, depending on the legal definition of victim, a plea deal that allows defendant to plead guilty to one offense in exchange for the dismissal of several other offenses may cause some victims to lose their legal victim status and render them ineligible for restitution in the case. A plea deal that includes defendant's agreement to pay restitution to all then existing victims can ensure that every victim will be awarded restitution even after charges are dropped as part of the plea bargain. Restitution is generally intended to compensate crime victims for all economic losses caused by the criminal conduct. Non-economic damages, such as paying and suffering, are typically excluded, but an exception may exist. For example, a California statute explicitly provides that certain child victims may recover paying and suffering as a part of restitution. Generally speaking, Criminal restitution should provide a broader range of financial recovery than administrative victim compensation. The losses recoverable under restitution may include, among other things, the value or cost to replace all lost or damaged property, the cost for anticipated future medical and mental health services, future lost income, attorney's fees, and other expenses incurred as a result of the investigation and prosecution of the crime. Unlike administrative victim compensation, Restitution laws do not have predetermined maximum awards. Unless otherwise specified by your jurisdiction's laws, there are usually four main ways for a crime victim to submit a restitution request to the court. First, the victim may simply inform the prosecutor, and the prosecutor will make the request on the victim's behalf. Some prosecutor's offices have restitution request forms that the victim may complete and submit. Second, the victim may be asked to describe his or her losses or give an impact statement to the writer of the pre-sentence report. Third, the victim or the victim's attorney may file a restitution memorandum that describes his or her losses. 
Lastly, the victim or the victim's attorney may present the request to the court through a victim impact statement in writing or through an oral victim impact statement given in person during a court hearing. No matter how the request is submitted, the request must be supported by documentation such as receipts, bills, invoices, repair estimates, and affidavits, or by testimony. In cases where calculation of losses may be complicated, such as calculation of expenses for future medical and mental health treatment, an expert witness can provide the necessary supporting evidence. Restitution is typically determined by a preponderance of the evidence standard. Restitution statutes may set forth deadlines for restitution requests. Generally, the request must be submitted to the court before sentencing, and the law may specify a particular date, such as 60 days before sentencing. Many laws provide for additional time after sentencing to submit the restitution calculation. If a victim misses a submission deadline due to matters beyond his or her control, courts usually have power to accept a late request for good cause. If the court issues an unfavorable ruling, appellate review is available. Our final stop is the civil justice avenue. Who pays whom in this system? Civil damages are paid by a defendant who is found liable in a civil lawsuit. In a civil action, the government is usually not involved unless the government is a party being sued. While this discussion on civil recovery focuses on the monetary award that may be won after a jury or bench trial, civil damages may also come from a defendant who does not admit fault or liability but agree to pay the victim to settle a civil lawsuit. Any person who has suffered injury caused by an offender may consider suing the offender in civil court, provided that the law recognizes that the offender has committed a civil wrong. In a civil case, the crime victim may recover more than economic losses. The victim may also recover non-economic losses, such as pain and suffering. Also, while not considered a loss suffered by the victim, the victim may also recover punitive damages in certain cases. This means civil lawsuits have the potential of providing the broadest form of financial recovery for crime victims. For victims who are represented by his or her own counsel, it is worth noting that attorney's fees are generally not recoverable in civil lawsuits unless a statute provides otherwise. The crime victim usually demands civil damages by filing a complaint that alleges claims for relief. For example, a victim who has been physically assaulted may, depending on the facts, sue the offender in civil court and allege tort claims such as assault, battery, and intentional or negligent infliction of emotional distress. In cases where the offender sues the victim for some alleged civil wrong, the victim may not only move to dismiss such an action, but may countersue by filing a counterclaim in the same action. The rules and procedures for civil lawsuits vary depending on the jurisdiction. As with administrative compensation claims and criminal restitution requests, the request for civil damages must be supported by documentation such as receipts, bills, invoices, repair estimates, and affidavits, or by testimony. In cases where calculation of losses may be complicated, such as calculation of expenses for future medical and mental health treatment or pain and suffering, an expert witness can provide the necessary supporting evidence. Like criminal restitution, the standard of proof for civil damages is the preponderance of the evidence standard. All states have filing deadlines, otherwise known as statutes of limitations. The limitations period varies depending on the claim at issue, typically ranging from one to four years after the misconduct or discovery of the injury. Many laws provide longer statutes of limitations for certain crimes, such as child victims of sexual assault. As with other avenues of financial discovery, the victim may appeal an unfavorable award. We'll conclude this overview of the three avenues of financial recovery with two final points. First, the laws do not permit double recovery for the same loss. So, if the victim compensation program paid a victim first for a loss that is also recoverable later, by way of criminal restitution or civil damages, the program may seek reimbursement from the victim or apply to the court to order the offender to pay a portion of the restitution or civil damages directly to the program. Second, depending on the facts, all three avenues may not be available to all crime victims. Attorneys and advocates interested in offering holistic services for crime victims should familiarize themselves with the three avenues of financial recovery to better assist crime victims with their goals of becoming financially whole. 
or as close to financially whole as possible in the aftermath of a crime. This concludes our overview of the three systems of financial recovery for crime victims. You can download a chart that compares key elements of administrative compensation, criminal restitution, and civil damages from NCVLI's online toolkit law library. Thank you for joining us. Please visit NCVLI's website for additional resources.